Hey everybody, it's Andy. Welcome to my weekly show where I help you build a career you love. And while I love to think every week is special, today I've got something a little extra special for you. We're gonna talk about job interviewing and in particular, I am gonna give you my top five lessons from my first book, Interview Intervention Communication That Gets You Hired. And if you are not familiar with me, or this book, since I developed the job interviewing methodology that I've packaged into this book, I developed it 14 years ago. Since that time, I've been teaching it, people have been following it, and statistically, historically, people that have used these techniques in job interviews have outpaced other job seekers by 560% in getting hired. This stuff works. And for those of you that are on the live stream with me today or watching the live stream in the future, I'm also gonna tell you about Larry, somebody who just found me a couple of weeks ago, was in the middle of an interviewing process. He emailed me, he asked me for some tips, wanted to know if he can get into a program, but asked me for some tips. I gave him a formula that he used to get a $25,000 pay increase, an extra 5K in a couple of months, and a 15% bonus to boot. So I'm gonna give you that formula as well. And the wonderful thing about today's show is all the stuff I'm gonna talk about, all the points I'm gonna go through, all the techniques that I'm gonna breeze through, you can get, because at the time we're recording this, this book is free. The hard book is free, the ebook and the audio book, you can get this anywhere in the world if you wanna pay $7 shipping and handling. So anything that I run through today, if you want more insight on it, get the book. All right, so now, for those of you that are here with me live, get in, say hello, let me know where you're from, let me know what you need, put some question marks in front of the questions, and I'm gonna get rolling in to go through through five, uh, through the five points, but I am very, very excited about today. It's gonna be a little bit different, a little bit, it's just always special to me anytime I talk about this. So, I've got the five key points, I got my note cards, let's roll. All right, so, the first main point is in chapter one of the book. And actually chapter one is titled, The World Actually Does Revolve Around You. And these are things that I don't see people doing nearly as often as they should. Um, and I'm gonna spend a little more time on number one here than some of the others, uh, because I think it's really important that we make sure that we get off to a great start. But the first, first big lesson in the book is you need to take stock. You need to take stock, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about some different things you need to take stock of. By the way, if you thought I was going to come to this show today and hit you with five points and run, well, that that's just some silly thinking. I got five lessons, I got a bonus, we got twenty-two subtopics, and I got note cards this thick. So, number one, take stock. But what do you got to take stock of? What do you got to take stock of? You got to take stock of your current situation. Your current situation. How many of you, I want you to think, I want you to look at yourself, well, keep looking at the screen, but think about it. Take a look in the figurative mirror for a second. How many of you, when you're job searching, now I know some of you are employed and you're looking for work, and some of you are unemployed and you're looking for work, but regardless, how many of you, or have you individually, sat down and thought about everything that you currently have. So if you're employed, what do you have now? If you were recently employed, you're no longer employed, what did you have most recently? So what in your current job did you have or do you have? And really think through that entire list. It's a great starting point. First off, it'll help you appreciate what you do have. Let's take Kara, for example. For those of you who don't know Kara, she's got the blue wrench. She's my trusty partner, she's always with me. She works with me. A lot of you Milo Academy members know her pretty well. She's got an awesome boss, right? She's got great flexibility. She has major impact. She's influ she is a seat at our table. She's influential in helping me create and design these programs for you. There's a lot that she has on her list of haves. And some of them she loves, some of them she will always need. Same thing for you. 
Think about everything that you actually have because it's easy to forget and take for granted the things we have. And as we make a change, lots of times we naturally assume that those things will be there. We take this for granted. So I want to make sure that you assess that current situation and you make a list of what you have. And even if it's real sweet gravy stuff, that's fine too. Just make sure you truly understand. And we're going to take a little bit deeper dive into this. And not only do I want you to take a look at, at what you have, I also want you to take a look at what you need. So some of what you currently have, you might need. And some of what you currently have, you might not really need. But there might be some things missing that you also need. Now, when it comes to needs, if you've had a chance to check out my job search masterclass, it's a three-part video series. It's available. I The link is in the description. Kara, if you can, maybe put the link out there for people so that they have it. It's also in the description. I'll put it in one of the cards uh, when, when, when this is recorded. Uh, but the first video in that program goes into great detail about how to identify your needs. I give you some tools and things that you can use. And I also give you a workbook that highlights the 15 most common needs that people have. And I got those 15 needs from all of the recruitment that I've done over the years. I run a search firm called Milewalk. And of all the people that I and the team have interviewed, that's more than 15,000 people, we've collected data of what people in general need. And I've packaged that up for you. So you might want to check that out. But make sure you take stock of what you need. Now, the third thing, and I see some people being a little bit careless with number three. This one here, timing considerations. Now, some of you may be unemployed and you need a job and timing is, is critical and you need, you need to find that job. I get that. But, but a lot of you are already employed and you are either passively looking or maybe very actively looking. But pause for a second and just make sure that the timing is really good for you to make a move. It could be anything. Um, you might be thinking about having a baby. Your, your, your spouse, your wife might be pregnant. You might be adopting. Uh, you might have a bonus coming up. You might have a vacation coming up. You might have a, a review coming up. It, it could be anything, any number of things. You might have uh, tuition reimbursement that your employer paid that you would have to pay back if you leave sooner than a certain date. Could be anything. Uh, maybe the kids are going back to school. Maybe you don't want to move in the middle of the school year. Whatever. Just make sure that you do consider the timing of things. And then another one that I see people almost no one paying any attention to, and this is something that we address early on with all the people that we recruit in my search firm, is up front, before you start to look, are you assessing a counter offer? Now, if you are, if you are unemployed, obviously this doesn't apply, but if you are employed and you're generally happy, maybe there's a thing or two that, that are missing. You have to think about, is there something my current employer could do to make me happy. Now, a lot of people, when I ask that question, they say, oh, no, you know, my employer doesn't give counteroffers. And I, I, always, I always clarify, I said, that's not actually the question I ask. The question I ask is, is there anything your current employer could do to get you to stay? So think about it. You go through a process, you interview with a company, you get an offer, you sign it, you go back to your employer, you say, hey, here's my resignation, I'm out of here. And the employer says, oh, come on, you can't leave. You know, what is it? Please tell me. You know, you want more vacation days, you want the corner office, you want more money, you want uh, more flexibility, you want some work from home time, whatever it is. Anything that is missing that you feel could keep you there, you need to think about perhaps having the conversation with your employer to make sure that they might not just be able to satisfy it. It is much easier for an employer to offer you a little bit more money than it is to think about this. You leave, they don't have anybody to backfill for you. They have to go and find somebody that takes time. They might have to pay either a recruitment firm or their recruiters now have to work on this. 
or maybe there's an employee referral bonus. They have to train the person, get them up to speed and so on. That's a very expensive proposition for them. So for them to give you a few more dollars is not such a big deal. Now, if you're interested in more on the counter offer, I wrote an article about this a while ago. We'll put this link in the notes as well, but there's a counter offer stuff is very bad. It's a very hairy situation. I could talk all day about counter offers. I won't, but I'll put the link to the article on the, on the uh, Tips for Working Life blog in the description so you can check it out if you're interested in more on that. And then the fifth thing that I want you to take stock of, which a lot of people don't do, and it sounds silly, compensation, compensation. Your compensation is not your salary and your year-end bonus. It's not just that. Sure, those are kind of the big ones you might know right off the top of your head. But if you get into an interviewing process, and I know there are some um, states and countries where the employer cannot solicit what you're currently earning, but whether they can solicit this or not, regardless, you have a mental number in your head. And throughout the process, you might be communicating this information. When you get down to the end and the employer gives you an offer, and here's $85,000 and a 10% bonus, and you currently make $80,000 and have no bonus, and that's what you asked for and the employer gave it to you and then you start thinking about the vacation days, the healthcare costs, the 401k match, your incentive stock options, whatever it might be, you are not going to be in a position or it's going to be a very uncomfortable position when you say, hey, well, I was only paying $200 a month uh, at my current job for healthcare and now I have to pay uh, you know, $800 a month, that's $600 a month, that's $7,200. The $5,000 that you gave me doesn't even cover the $7,200 more that I have to pay. So you want to be crystal clear on what you really have financially. And I have a little download for that. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful one-page cheat sheet. It covers all the, the areas that you need to consider. Everything that I just mentioned, but even things like car allowances and tuition reimbursements and training dollars and all that other good stuff, uh, telephone uh, coverage, you know that kind of stuff. You want to make sure that you truly understand what it is that you get paid financially or what it means to you. So that's very, very important. All right, so that, that kind of encapsulates uh, point lesson number one. Lesson number two is the entire reason the book was written. The entire reason I wrote Interview Intervention was that the issues that I was seeing that were present among job candidates that we were coaching, uh, corporations, the hiring companies that we were working on behalf of, the interaction between untrained interviewers and very solid job candidates, and the thing that I noticed was that the reason that you get the job is, is very distant from what people normally think. Your qualifications get you the job interview. Your resume gets you a job interview. But beyond that, you have to consider that everybody in the process is likely qualified. So you're qualified as a job seeker in somebody's recruitment process, but so too are the other job seekers. So what, who, what ultimately determines who's going to get hired? Well, Number, lesson number two is there's three reasons why you get the job, and they have to do with communication. Communication. So assuming that you're all qualified and all things being equal, which job candidate is ultimately going to get the job? Well, there's three reasons you get hired. Let's, go, let's run through those pretty quickly. The first one is your ability as a job candidate uh, and, and, and interviewing with the company to articulate your fit and value. So the first thing is you get asked a bunch of questions in the interview. You are articulating your responses, but those responses need to be covering why the employer is hiring in the first place. So what is it that the employer needs? What's the employer's gap? We call it selling to the gap. Basically, if you can solve somebody's problem, you become their hero and they hire you. So the person who can most effectively dial in how she fits what they need and the value she will contribute, and we call this encoding your message, can encode their message effectively, has a leg up. But it's not just about saying it perfectly. How many times have you been in a conversation where it's coming out of your mouth, you think you're articulating it perfectly, but the other person isn't getting it? So the interviewer has to decode what you say. So just because you said it perfectly doesn't mean they got it perfectly. So the interviewer has to decode what you said. 
and they might they might misunderstand what you said. So there are issues, communication issues that arise for many reasons because they didn't didn't decode it properly. And the third the third element of 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 what uh, of what you need to understand is it's not just that they they heard you properly but the interviewer has a capacity to remember you because these interviewing decisions do not happen in real time. So the job candidate who can most effectively articulate her fit and value to an interviewer who understood her, who also remembers her in the right light. The interviewers never remember the specifics of what you tell them. They always remember how you made them feel and they pl pr plant little breadcrumbs in their mind that they have to recall in the future when they're assessing. Think about it. These hiring decisions don't happen in real time. What does happen in real time is the decision not to hire you, but assuming you got the goods, assuming you're responding effectively, you'll be on your way. You just need to make sure that they recall you properly. So how do we how do we make sure that we do those things? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the techniques. And if you if you want more on all those communication issues, the eight different communication issues that arise, the biases that are present in the parties that are speaking to each other, in addition to the interview intervention book, which you can grab, I also did a one hour video on three keys to ace any job interview. I go into great detail about these three points, the eight communication uh, pitfalls or, or tri trip wires, whatever you want to call them, and, and I clarify why they're present and what you can do about it. And let's talk a little bit about that. The third point that I want to run through, I call it storytelling. Okay, now this is nothing more, that's my vernacular, but basically when you respond to the questions that you were asked, you're asked a couple of different types of questions. You're either asked questions about your past in which you need to tell how you did something, thought something, felt something, or whatever. Or you're asked questions about your future, which are more simulation type. How would you handle this situation in our environment? So they either ask you about your past or they ask you about your future. Whichever one it is, you have to give them a response in the form of a story, how you did something or how you will do something. So in order to tell effective stories, that help you articulate your fit and value correctly, make sure they can decode you correctly, remember you, like you, believe you, and all the things that you need them to do. There are, in the book I go through six, six different steps. Today we're gonna go through five key ways that you can tell stories that are believable, memorable, and get them to like you. The first one is, no, you don't need to kiss me. You blow me a kiss if you want, or you can blow me a chat kiss keeping it short and simple. So it's very tempting, it's very tempting, right? To want to tell them about your greatness and all the things and the glory that is you. But, but when you are responding, you wanna make sure you are sticking to information they need to know and can supplement that with any follow-up questions that they might have. But you want to keep your response tight. That's not really hard to understand. We all wanna be, we all wanna be crisp and clean. And this is a little bit more difficult. You've got to, you've got to capture and keep their attention. Don't think for one second that you actually have somebody's attention in the middle of a day at, you know, eleven eighteen on a Thursday, uh, in, in in the central U.S. If somebody is sitting across that table from you, they are likely paid to do something other than interview you. Than than interview you. So they have a job. They have deadlines, they have a boss, they have customers, they have teammates. All this stuff is going on in their head while they're trying to interview you and assess your skills and your capabilities and all that other good stuff. So you need to be able to capture their attention and once you have it, you need to keep it. Now there are different ways to do that. I go into all that stuff in the book. I also go into that in Three Keys to Ace Any Job Interview. But you gotta make sure that you are in tune with them, that they are listening to you. You have, to, you have to realize just because they're sitting there and they're looking at you does not mean they're, they're necessarily paying attention. They probably got a lot of distractions. And it, it, it's even worse if you can't talk in their language. So you've got to make sure that you're using the proper lingo or the proper language. And while this may sound obvious, this is one of the more difficult things to do. Why? Think about this. And I know a lot of you are seasoned vets out there. Can you even remember what it was like not to know what you know? It's so difficult for me as I come to these talks every week and I shoot my videos and I build my training courses. 
I can't remember what it was like not to know how to job search. But I have to consciously think about if I'm you, how do I have to package and articulate this? So it's the same kind of thing. If you're a technologist talking to an HR person or you're a technologist talking to a senior exec, how are you going to adjust your language to make sure you're hitting the mark so that they actually understand you? Very, very important. And then rolling on number four, while talking in their language might be a little hard, getting them to believe you should not be. This should be one of the easiest things that you need to be able to do. Now, you've got to have trust. You've got to have credibility. And one of the easiest ways to gain that in an interview is the way in which you package up the sequence of your stories. So you want to make sure that as you are responding, there's a beginning, a middle, and end. It kind of flows in time orientation. You're not hopping all over the place. And that you also are very precise and specific about the details that you include in the story. The more precise your metrics are, the story steps, whatever it is, the more believable it is because the people who have lived through these projects should know them and remember them. And I realize some of these projects that you're discussing in your job interview happened 10 years ago. If it's on your resume, it's fair game. So I suggest that you go back and you really think about you really think about uh, what was going on at the time. As a matter of fact, one of the things, and I didn't put this in the description, maybe Kara can, can plop this into the chat, is uh, I, I have a career achievements journal uh, which highlights 14 different elements that you should capture from every project that you do that will, number one, help you remember it and have a wonderful journal as you go through your career, especially if you're getting promoted and those kind of things. You want to make sure you understand the impacts, but also as you populate your resume and as you tell the stories in the job interviews like this. It's a wonderful tool. It's just a simple download. Uh, I have a video on it as well. You can go check that out. But but you really need to make sure that you, re you can recall the details and the specifics of what was there. And then to round it out, this is, I mean, this is your home run right here. If you do the first four and you get them to care about you, you're, you're golden. Now, to get them to care, what's the easiest way to get somebody to care about you? To show them you care about them. How knowing you, having you at their company is going to make their lives better. So you need to be specific with the different types of interviewers that you're likely to have, whether it's a superior or a peer or somebody on your level or a, a subordinate if you're a managerial resource. How are you going to make their, their particular lives better and, and the impact that your stories are going to have on their lives? So that's number three. Now, rolling on to number four, let's shift this kind of to the other side of the table. You get what you ask for. You get what you ask for. So now, now we're venturing into the territory where you are given an opportunity to ask questions. So when you ask questions, there's a number of things you need to keep in mind. The first thing that should be going through your mind when you're asking a question is not, I need to get information. I know that's why you think you asked the question and why most people think they asked the question. I think it's to continue selling yourself. So if you think about the way you design your questions, you need to be able to roll into the question the type of research you did, the astute observation you made that, that bred a question in your mind that you are now going to ask. So you always, anything that you do, anything that you say, anything that you don't say, anything that you tell, anything that you ask, everything that you do in the entire process from the time you fill in the application is selling yourself. So you have to think about that. Always, always think about that First and foremost, there's plenty of times throughout the entire process for you to ask questions to get the information you, you need. And let's talk about that. Second thing is, you got to get what you need. So you do have to get the information. You do have to get the information. So I want to, I want to, I use this word. Oops, I use, wait, here we go. I use this word on purpose, your needs, what you need specifically, not what you, you know, I could have said what you want to know, but it's about your needs. Every time you ask a question, and everything that you do and you observe in the process, in an interviewing process, is designed to do two things. You are trying to elicit information, number one, to determine if it's a good company, and number two, to determine if it is a good company for you. For you. Those are not always the same things. It could be a good company. It just might not be a good fit for you. 
Okay, so every time you ask a question, you need to make sure that you're getting the answer to both of those questions. That's what you're trying to do. So the easiest way to get at what you need is going back to the first step that I mentioned, taking stock, identifying your needs, and then using those needs to spawn questions that you are going to ask so that you're not hopping all over the place. You've got a nice flow and a nice sequence to them, but you make sure that you've got an inventory of questions that are going to help you determine if it matches what you need. That's one element. The other thing about asking the question is you not only need to get what you need, you need to get it quickly. You need to get it fast. Okay, and why is this important? Well, a couple of reasons. The faster you can get the information you need, the more time it frees up to get more information you need. The more information you get, the more educated your decision about taking that job. Because we know you're gonna get the offer because you're crushing it with these techniques. So you wanna get it as quickly as possible. Easiest way to get it as quickly as possible is, is as you're asking your question, to be very specific about the information you're looking for. The more open-ended your question, the greater the likelihood that the interviewer misunderstands why you want to know something or runs off on a story and goes off on a bunch of tangents while they might include some information that's great for you to know it's not specifically what you needed to know to know whether it satisfied your need or your criteria and what what does that do it wastes a lot of time and now you're left with a lot less time to ask subsequent questions. So you want to get it quickly. And the other thing that you want to you want to make sure that you're mindful of when you're asking questions is when am I going to use the information that they give me when I ask the question? So let's think about this. Whenever you ask a question, you're going to get information. Let's hope they give you whatever you asked for. When they give you that information, you have a couple of options of what to do with it. You can use it right away to sell yourself in the process, or you can take it home and think about it and talk to your wife and see if, 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 you know, if this is a good company based on that information and ponder it. So let's talk about an example here. When I ask a question in an interview, if I ask you a question such as, what are the characteristics of the type of people who are successful in the role or, or have historically been successful in the role, and the interviewer gives me the response back, you know, that we're looking for this, 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 and this, or self-starters, detail-oriented, customer service focused, and so on, I can immediately use that information to sell myself right now. Right now in the next breath, or in the thank you email I'm gonna send them after the, after the session, or in the next interview, that afternoon, the next day, or whenever. That is short-term usage of great information that I now can give them back what they need because that's why I'm a self-starter and so forth. Versus a question such as, well, what type of training opportunities will I have and what type of training programs will I be put through or have the opportunity to take? That's great information. I want you to ask the question, but you're going to use that information later. You're just going to ponder it. It's just going to go into whether this is you know, a great overall package for you. So those, the, the equality and the benefit of having the information sooner matters on stuff that you're going to use sooner. So that's, that's, uh, that's round, that rounds out the asking the questions part. And then number five, I want you to absolutely close like a pro. And I'll tell you the biggest mistakes that I see people making at the close of the interview and what you should do. You thought the interview went well. Think about this. How many times have you thought an interview went great or pretty good only to get called or emailed to say, eh, didn't, didn't, did, did, didn't work out? And you're, you're scratching your head. Well, let me show you some ways that you could if not have diffused that, at least recognized it at the moment of the interview that something like this was likely to happen. So let's talk about that. How do you, how do you close like a pro? Well, what do pros do? They leave no doubt at the end that they are the right candidate for the job. And leaving no doubt takes a couple of steps. Now, you have to make sure that they have no doubt about you so one of the best ways to do that is throughout the process to make sure that you were following the techniques and implementing the storytelling principles and making sure you were mindful of potential communication issues and all that great stuff. 
Okay, so if you've done all that effectively, when you get down to the end, it's a little bit of a cleanup time. You gotta make sure, you're making absolutely sure that you're going through your checklist again right before the interview breaks. So one of the easiest ways to do that is to ask, do they have any reservations about hiring you? So I know we've been talking for an hour, this is all great and good, um, this is basically the second to last thing that you want to do. Do you have any reservations about hiring me? And you need to ask it in a closed form like that because you ultimately need to surface the reservations. If you leave it open-ended and you say, well, you know, is there anything else more that you need to know about me? Is there anything else I can add or anything I need to send you as a follow? None of that stuff works. None of that stuff works. It's, 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 you may as well not even utter the words. So if you are trying to get at the reasons why they will not hire you and the reservation will come in one of three forms. They will either have misunderstood something that you said, one of the communication issues, you told them a story, they didn't decode it correctly, and now you have a chance to clarify it right at the end so they don't go to bed angry, so to speak. Or or they drew a false assumption about something that they didn't even ask you about. So you have to realize, right, these are short, these interviewers, interviews are short. They're an hour or they're less and you've got to jam in a lot of information in a short amount of time. So what are the interviewers doing? They're, they're extrapolating, they're using their biases, they're making assumptions about whether you can do something or have done something. So, because they can't get to everything, they have to make some assumptions about you and whether you can do certain things. In the absence of information, people draw their own conclusions and it's always bad. When was the last time somebody assumed positively? But we wanna get them assuming positively about you, but if they made a false assumption, what can you do now? If there's a reservation because they say, well, you know, I wish you would have had a little more experience in this area, you, and, you, and you do, you can now clarify it even if it wasn't on your resume or they didn't ask you about it, you now have a chance at the end to catch it. Or third, what's the third type of reservation? It's a reservation. It's an actual problem. If it's an actual problem, what do we want to do with it? Number one, I want to know it. And number two, I want to take a few moments right there to dampen it and to let them know that they shouldn't worry about that. And you don't need to use those words, but I mean, you can tell them, well, even though I haven't done that yet, here's what I have done. Here's how I educate myself and get up to speed. Here's the plan I put in place to make sure that anytime I encounter something that I haven't done before, this is what I do. Now, all of a sudden, they're not as worried about the reservation because they know that you have some analogous experience and you have, a, you have an approach that you will implement should you encounter that. It's gonna make them feel better. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect of closing is, uh, I have this little technique. Uh, this is really an acronym, but it's really for me. Uh, I call it, I want, you to, I want you to confirm, assure, and close, C-A-C. So first thing I want you to do after you ask the reservations question is to make sure that you are confirming your understanding of the role to the employer. This is where they need to be reminded that it's okay to hire you. No one wants to make a decision anymore. You're trying to make them feel better about the decision you want them to make. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that they feel that you understand what you're getting into and that you're the right person for the job and that you're very interested. So first part is I wanna confirm that I understand that this is what you're looking for. Literally spit back a sentence or two of the job description or however they describe the job to them. That's the first thing. Second thing is, once they say, okay, you got it, say, okay, well, I wanna assure you I'm the right person for the job because, and then remind them of what, why you are the best candidate for the job. Because I have X number of experience doing exactly that thing that you need me to do, and I've seen it at three different companies and so on, whatever it is. And then the third thing that you wanna do is you wanna make them feel good about your interest. So I wanna, I wanna confirm that I'm, or I'm gonna close up with, I'm interested in this role. I'd love to know what's next. What's the next step in the process? You always, 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 always wanna ask that. And if they are a person of authority and can make a decision, 
they will tell you, or you will at least know how they're feeling. If they are somebody who, who cannot make that call, maybe you've, maybe you've been through a day of interviews and they're the fifth or sixth person that you're talking to, if they don't know or they can't make that decision, you can at least ask them what would normally occur for somebody who's moving on in the process. What would be next? You always want to get that information. You always want to get that information because you want to know. Every week, week in and week out, I always get asked a question about, you know, how long should I wait and all this good stuff. If you ask these questions, you'll have a much better indication. So you want to make sure that you're closing like a pro. So we went through the five. So you want to make sure you're taking stock. You want to make sure you understand three reasons why you get the job. It has everything to do with communication. You want to make sure you're telling the right stories. You get what you ask for, so make sure that you're questioning them properly. And the fifth thing is you want to close like a pro. Now, I have a bonus because I, I would never, I would never talk about interview intervention or any kind of interviewing if we did not talk about giving thanks. Thank yous, thank you emails, thank you phone calls, thank you letters, thank you whatevers. This separates candidates that are close. People that are continually marketing themselves throughout the interviewing process with fast and thoughtful thank you emails are the ones that get the job. So in addition to making sure that you're articulating your fit and value, you're telling the right stories, all that good stuff, you have to assume everybody else is able to do that. So after every interview, there's a couple of things about the thank yous that I want you to keep in mind. And I have loads of of videos on thank yous and templates and all that stuff's in the description. But one of the things you wanna make sure that you uh, that you do is you do it quickly. So there's, a, there's two elements about a thank you. It needs to be speedy. So you should respond within 24 hours. If it's Friday at five o'clock, that means by Saturday at six o'clock, you need to send them an email thanking them. And I'm not going to go into all the stuff about it, but I do want I do want to highlight that there's one other element about the thank you that is important in order for it to work. It needs to be thoughtful. So if you send something within 24 hours or two minutes and it only says, hey, thanks for your time, looking forward to hearing from you, that's not thoughtful. It's fast, but it's not thoughtful. So what makes it what makes it thoughtful? Thanking them for their time. You want to make sure that the thank you actually thanks them. The selling part. What did I say? Everything that you do, every facial expression, every gesture, every non-gesture, everything that you do, every email that you send, every letter you write, whatever it is, contributes to your ability to sell yourself, or you should be. This is an opportunity for you to highlight why you're the best person for the role. That's the second part of the thank you. And the third thing that, that you want to do is you want to confirm your interest. So, so I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm more excited. You're the best thing I ever saw. Whatever you want to say, I give you the template. It's also an interview intervention. And so those are, you know, those are the, the kind of the five, six things that I wanted to run through. Now, I want to tell you about a couple other things. I want to show you uh, that, that what Larry, so I got an email. Uh, I got an email a uh, couple of, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was just two weeks, two weeks ago, uh, Larry had just found me and he said, uh, he, he, he bought, he got the book for, he, uh, got the free book. He was on its way. And while he was waiting, he watched three keys to ace any job interview. He emailed me and he said, Hey, Andy, I, I, or Andrew, I saw, uh, I got the book. I saw the three keys to ace any job interview. Uh, your boot camp looks like a fantastic value, but I'm in the middle of an interviewing process and I have an interview next week and I don't think I'll have time to go through all of it. So this is the email uh, that I sent him and he he actually uh, sent me that email that I just described and here's here's what I sent to him. So if you look at the bottom, he said he at, he'd asked me, "Do you have anything else that I could go through quickly? I'm happy to enroll in the Mile Walk Academy. What should I do?" So the bottom the bottom of the email, it, the bottom portion of the email. So on August 9th, he emails me. I said, "Hey, look, um, you know, you've already got the book. Get the interview intervention course. Uh, the course itself it includes a session from my boot camp." 
It includes a session from my boot camp. And here's what I'd actually do. I'd, I'd enroll in the course. It's 297, as you can see from the you know bottom left there in, the, in red. It's a $300 course. Here's what, here's what you should do. Enroll, watch the boot camp session because it's a crash course. It has everything you need. Then read interview intervention. You have access to the ebook and the audio book and all that good stuff. And then go through the rest of the interview intervention course, which is designed in a series of, you know, two to 10 minute videos that cover all the stuff that take the book down to another level, get the job. And then he, he got a bonus because he paid 300 bucks. Uh, the previous, um, my, in my, I have a monthly coaching program and the previous session in my monthly coaching program was to talk about what to do in your first 90 days. So that's the email I sent him. And then up top, on August 17th, this is the email I got from him. He just wanted to say thanks. He'd gotten a $25,000 salary increase and he got a, you know, an, another 5K in six months and a 15% bonus. What an ROI. So at a minimum, at a minimum, what you can do is you can grab the free book Grab the free book. That's going to go a long way. And the way to grab this is we have a link in the description. And it's, you know, Kara will throw it in the chat. If you go to the page, just enroll, uh, just put your name in and your email and fill in your shipping address. When you pay $7, not only do you get the book shipped anywhere, you get the ebook, you get the audio book, and you also get a PDF. Uh, that I carved out that's a, another ebook special called How to Interview the Employer, 75 Great Questions to Ask Before You Take Any Job. But for because I'm an interview intervention mania today, through today and tomorrow only, the $300 course you can get for 97 bucks. So you can have all of this uh, and a book and all that good stuff for, for $97. And the easiest way to get that is just click the link uh, to the book page and you'll notice on the page where you're filling in your shipping information, all that good stuff, there's a little checkbox that just says, give me the course for $97. So you can have it. So it's just a little something that I wanted to throw in. Um, I, I let Larry pitch it for me. It's just something that I wanted to do. You know, we don't put that, that program on special much. We do a lot with the boot camp. Uh, which you are also going to get the interviewing portion of the boot camp, and you can also come to that live training session uh, next month or month after whenever we're having the next one. But it's a really great deal. It's good for you for through tomorrow night. So I just want to let you know that I love this stuff. I hope you enjoyed that. If you're watching this on the recording, uh, have fun. I'll see you next week. Uh, for those of you that are here, let's go to the chat. If you're loving this, do me a favor, click the thumbs up button, subscribe, share this, because we're going to spend a bunch of time here now going through the Q&A, give you some time to grab the course. Or if you got any questions on that, uh, I'll be happy to answer those. But let's see. Let me see who's who's actually here. Mark Peckney. Mark Peckney is a boot camper. He's a great dude. Hey, Sunny Day. Irene, how are you? And Foxy Gaming, We I now know that that's that that's Jill. Uh, Jill, glad you're on the right account. Jill's a boot camper. Elliot's a boot camper. Great to see you. Connie Cotter's a boot camper. Man, this is great stuff. Ron, how are you? Debbie, how are you? Boot camper. Davida, great from you. I hope it's not too hot. Rory, he's a boot camper. Man, my God, you guys. Chammy and Thomas, nice to see you. That's a new name for me. Let me know if you're a first timer. Jasmine, how are you? Star Dutsty. MK, boot camper. Hey, Hector, how are you? Kristen's a boot camper. Dr. Dermick's girl. I don't know who. Oh, first timer. Hey, oh, first time you made it live. Great. Th thank you for coming. I love having you. Love having you. Here we go. Stephanie has a question. All right, hang on. Let me just make sure. Kara, just let me know if I am on the right spot. All right, what is the best way to explain a career gap? Can I say I have been volunteering, helping my elderly mom, and have been selective as to who I interview with? Yes. I almost, not to be funny, Stephanie, I, I always recommend, so for those of you that have been following me, you know my default answer to everything. My first reaction always is be honest, just explain it. Just, and if that's what you've been doing, um, that's what I would say. Now, I, I obviously don't know how long you've been, uh, you've had a career gap. 
Uh, but, I mean, a year, two, three, these things happen. They happen. So I would not have any issue. Uh, that's what I would say. That's what I would say. If you've got, now remember, if you are interviewing, the employer feels as though you've got the goods. There, there's a reason that you're on a phone screen or that you're talking to the HR person or you're talking to the hiring official or you're going through the rounds of interviews. So, you know, be, be comfortable with that and just explain your situation. You know, there's nothing, no reason to hide it. No reason to hide it. Okay, hope that helps. Okay, Kara put the book from the interview intervention. Yeah, so folks, I, I really hope you grab it. We've been having loads of luck with people uh, you know, even just the free book, but, um, but it's really, it's really been, really been great. D, how are you? Great to see you. I feel you. You're close. Donald, how you doing? He, he, uh, he got the book. He got the book. I know he did. Glad, uh, glad you enjoyed it. Thanks Rory for having my back. Pansy, how are you? Gabby Marbray. Gary Marbray, how are you? All right, or Gabby Mar Marbray, sorry. Thanks for all your advice. Just got the book. By the way, I'm sending my app resume cover letter today for a courthouse position. I have experience from 10 years ago. I'm not sure they can see my transferable skills. Now you need to highlight that, uh, Gabby. Wait, by the way, one, one, thing, one thing I forgot to mention. For all of you that have the book, if you, have, if you, if you already have the book, or you have the ebook and the audio book already, maybe you got the digital experience and you wanna get into the course for the 97 bucks, just email me at support at milewalk.com and we will give you a private link to get that. Um, otherwise, it's only on, on the book, uh, you know, on the book page for the next uh, next day or so. So if you if you are somebody who has the book and you've enjoyed it and you want more training, uh, and more coaching, then you're welcome to email me. But Gabby, it's, um, you know, I, I'm guessing what you're asking. So Gabby's asking, you know, uh, she's she's uh, putting in her, her cover letter for a courthouse position. Uh, the experience is from 10 years ago. I'm not sure they can see my transferable skills. I'm assuming that you have experience in that uh, in that realm, and if that's the case, I would be pulling that stuff up to the career profile and the career highlights. And if you're not sure how to do that, check out my video called How to Build the Ultimate Professional Resume. It's free, it's 18 minutes or 19 minutes or something like that, and I show you how to, how to write the resume. The other thing, uh, Gabby, that you can do, and that I actually I would highly recommend this, uh, in my free webinar, Three Secrets, uh, to get your resume noticed. It's about an hour long, maybe 50 minutes, a webinar is the teaching portion. And then at the end of the teaching portion, I give you a, a freebie, a, a download called my Resume Content Builder. The Resume Content Builder has the resume template in it, but it also has much more detailed instruction about what to put in each section and the specific topic areas you should cover in the career profile, in the career highlights, and throughout. And uh, it's really a great, uh, really a great tool. And the other thing it has that Resume Content Builder has in it is, uh, and I mentioned my career achievements journal, but I put a journal in the back of the Content Builder to stimulate your thinking about the key components of each of the different projects and experience that you have that you should be thinking about that go into the resume. I would do that, and I would pull that stuff forward. And you can, and it doesn't matter if it was ten years ago. That's the beauty of the career profile. It allows you to control the narrative. All right, hope that helps. Davida, I read a posting on LinkedIn where one individual said that after about age 58, he noticed that it is substantially harder to get visas for international jobs. Your thoughts on how to circumvent this? I don't know uh, the ins and outs and the discrimination or difficulty levels for you know getting visas at any age. Um, I mean, I, I understand that there is a process. Some of these visas can be sponsored by employers and all that good stuff. But I am I am by no means an expert on on visas or any of the different types uh, of visas. I'm not I'm not sure what to tell you there. I would I would honestly my best advice 
uh, for any of you that are working internationally, inside the US, outside the US, different countries or wherever, and you need visas, I would, uh, I would, I would get with employment lawyers or immigration lawyers or other legal counsel that has a much better understanding of that process and what you need to go through. I, I, I would never want to advise on that um, because I'm, I'm just not, I'm not that clear on, on how I would, uh, how I would try to circumvent that. All right, um, Sam, how are you? Danny, how are you? Thomas, great to see you. Can you give any tips on getting an entry level IT job? So Thomas, the one thing that I would say is um, regardless of the specific job function, so you're an IT, um, the, the best uh, advice I would give you is to go watch my hour-long webinar called How to Find a Job You Love. You get a great um, giveaway there. You get the 10 steps to actually surfacing that job, and that works whether you're an entry-level person or you are a seasoned vet. So um, when you talk about getting a job, the, anything that is related to job searching I would check out my 10 by 10 job search formula. It's a free download and it works really, really well with the how to find a job you love webinar. Those are my, basically, if you go to the Mile Walk Academy, the assets that I have, that's my training site, milewalkacademy.com. The assets are broken up by different training courses that you can pay for or coaching programs that you can pay for. Then there's a lot of the free stuff in, in the form of video series, uh, webinars, downloads, and other things. There's a resume interview, or sorry, resume webinar, there's an interviewing webinar, and there's a job searching webinar. You can go watch all three of those if you want, they're all free. I have other webinars that are not on the page and I'm not running them now, they're related to career changing and some other stuff and I've got some other things coming. But job, anything job searching and targeting related, I would, um, I would watch how to find a job you love. The other thing I would point you to, Thomas, is I did a live office hours uh, in January. I, I think it was January. Uh, you know, I do these every week, but I, I think it was January, where it's titled um, uh, Why Your Job Search is Taking So Long. And I did another one on how to create a target company list. And I would watch those because that talks to you about targeting uh, organizations and, and positions and, and those kind of things. So it doesn't matter if you're entry level or if you're a seasoned vet, the tactics are the same. They really are. You might you know alter your resume a bit, but uh, I have a college resume template out there too. So I hope that helps. All right, uh, Sam, let me see. All right, we got a few of you guys going back and forth, love that. Wait, I think this is a question. Groovy Flea. All right, I had a second interview for a position and there's another position I'm interested in that's a higher level that I'm qualified for. Is it appropriate to ask to be considered for that position too? Groovy Flea, yes. Everybody, yes. Okay, so uh, wait, that's my answer. Just, Just yes, you should. And the other thing that I would uh, highly recommend for all of you to watch is uh, how to use job descriptions to ace your interview. I have a live office hours that I did on how to use job descriptions to ace your interview. The reason I'm telling you that is in that video, I go into how to look at the positions below and above to make sure of a few things and also to package up your stories in your interview. And it will surface situations like this that you will know in advance of going in because you know, you're going into an interview and you might have discovered it along the way. But it would be really great if you had this information in advance. So you definitely want to do that. I hope that helped. All right. And everybody seems to like Groovy Flea's question because that was a darn good one. Hey, Natalia, great to see you. B3 on, or so beyond beautiful, I'm assuming that is. Question, uh, 
If a company tells you in response to a follow-up email regarding application receipt that they will contact you within a couple of days, but for over a week you don't hear from them, do you contact them again? Yes. Okay. Great question. So let's recap this one because it's a great one. Beyond Beautiful asks, if a company tells you in response to a follow-up email regarding an application receipt that they will contact you within a couple of days, but haven't for over a week, do you contact them again? Yes. So here's what I would do. Whenever any of you put an application in, regardless of whether you hear back or not, contact them again in seven days. Try to find an email, try to get at somebody to say, I want to follow up on an application that I submitted. So seven days. If they tell you that they will contact you within a couple of days, which is what they said. A couple is two. A few is three. If they say a couple days, that's two, wait seven days beyond that because, because you have not engaged with them. You sent them an application and a follow-up email, or, or sorry, they sent you a follow-up email. You haven't engaged in an interview yet. So in this case, I want you to wait seven full days. So nine days total from the time you submitted it or whenever it was to, that you interacted, sorry, the last time you interacted to contact them. If you interviewed and they said, we will contact you in a couple days and they, you have not heard from them in a couple days, then you wait two days and contact them because you are now engaged with them and they said to you, we'll contact you in a couple days. So to miss it by 100% is bad, is bad. You don't know what happened. Priorities could have shifted and all that good stuff in your particular case. But if you are engaged with them and they say that, you need, you need to allow for that. And it's, you, need, you, need, you need basically you need to call them back sooner. So Beyond Beautiful, I hope that helps. It gave you a couple of variations there. But I think, I think that's the way you want to go. All right. All right. Fahil, question, should we put logo of certificates in your resume? Folks, awesome question. Never put logos in your resume. Why not? Because applicant tracking systems hate graphics. So if you uh, have not uh, seen job scan it's the tool i recommend kara maybe we could put the link in uh my my referral link it's free for 30 days and there's a number of other things that you can do to extend that but basically whenever you uh, are putting your resume together and you are applying to a job i always recommend that you look at the job description you use job scan i have a, a video on how to use it it's called three free tools uh, for your resume to beat the applicant tracking system you can check that out but one of the things that you will notice, uh, and, and, and job, I know this from interviewing recruiters and asking them in, in, the, in the live surveys and things that we do in the data collection, but also the job scan tool will show you that when you put in your resume, it's going to tell you don't use charts, graphs, pictures, or any of that because applicant tracking systems are very stupid. Um, the more plain your resume is, the easier it is for them to digest and understand and index what's in there and determine if it's matching what they need. What I would recommend that you do is I would put the certificate, uh, the, you know, I achieved this certification and so forth. And you could even put your certification number if it's a kind of thing that an employer might want to verify if it's a really high level one. Uh, I recommend that if you're a program uh, manager or pro sorry project manager and you have your PMP certification, just put PMP certification. Actually, put put pro, you know project management professional certification from Project Management Institute because the applicant tracking systems also don't like the abbreviations. So uh, that's another thing that you will find out if you if you use JobScan or some of the other tools like that. But I like I like JobScan. It's not perfect, but it's darn good. It's darn good. Check that out. So I hope that helps. Hey, Patricia, how are you? Sam, great. <laughs> Thanks for that one, buddy. Uh, really nice. All right. That was, uh, that, was, that was pretty funny. All right. Hey, Rory, the zombie review. After so long without calls or interviews and not getting the jobs, how do you keep your head up and keep motivated? Um, Rory, 
I always tell people that, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, wait, I want to I want to try to make sure if I uh, the the reason I'm thinking is I just gave uh, a talk on this. Oh goodness, now I'm blanking. Hang on, give me a second. It'll it'll come back to me. But either last week or the week before, I talked about why people get unhappy in their job search and they're they're using the wrong metrics and they're 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 you know you for example might be uh, evaluating or determining how you feel or your worth or your value based on whether you're getting callbacks or not callbacks you might be putting your resume into a lot of applicant tracking systems and other things I'm not going to go into all the the metrics that I want you to go through and Kara maybe you can uh, catch I think it might have been last week I can't remember how I how I titled it but uh, I, I shoot so many of these things but um, but I talked about which metrics you should be using to determine the overall health of your job search so you want to I would check that out and hopefully Kara can catch me and figure out what the specific uh, live office hours was but I think it was you know it was the one last week um, you know the things to do in your job search to you know get hired and to stay positive uh, I'm pretty sure that's what I called it get hired you know how to how to stay happy and, and get hired or you know in your job search or something like that but it was the live office hours from last week so I would watch that because I go through specifically what to do and then I, I think I think you'll you'll be feeling better if you can shift what you're doing to match what I recommended and also monitor the metrics and I think it'll 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 help you feel a lot better. All right. All right, nice W75. Hi Andy, a potential job offer from an employer who's private rather than public. How does one go about requesting to see their annual report and and other stuff to determine finances, health before accepting any offer? So, Nice W75. Here's what I do. So first thing I do is I ask them. I ask them for it uh, because I want to know the overall financial stability of your company. If they will not share it, ask them what they can share. So what can they tell you about number of customers, you know, percentage of revenue in different sectors, you know, whatever it might be that is important. The other thing that you can do is you can look at uh, uh, sites like Hoover's and some of these others uh, that Thomson Reuters and other other uh, systems and data collection agencies that have insight on these organizations. Some of these sites are free. Some of these sites you need to pay for, but I guess you need just need to determine, um, and you might even be able to do like a trial membership just to kind of get in and check it out. But that's what I would do. I would ask. I would ask for the specifics that I wanted. If they didn't do that, I would ask them for what is it that they could tell me. I would kind of have a next layer so that they're not revealing all their specifics. And then the third thing that I would do is I would look at sites like data.com, Hoover's, Thompson's, and so forth, uh, the Dun & Bradstreet style uh, um, systems that you might be able to, uh, to get that data from. So I hope that helps. And Kristen is wondering where the masterclass is. The masterclass is actually public, uh, Kristen. It's not in the Mao Academy, although I probably should just put that in there to make it easy for you guys. Um, free from boredom. Free from boredom asks, just got a contract to hire job offer. Wonderful. Um, so I'm assuming you are in the contract stage. I know this is a very long interview. What should my strategy be to make sure that I convert? Oh, um, freedom from boredom. I I would love to give you a specific answer there. Um, aside from aside from you know watching three keys to ace any job interview or get and getting the interview intervention book. I mean, all the tactics that I would tell you to employ are in there. And 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 you know, without knowing uh, what specifically you do or what they're going after or what the style of the interview is or whatever, I can't give you much more specifics than that. But the one thing that I can I can promise you is all the stuff that's all the stuff that's in the book, this applies to anybody at any level, at any type of job. So, 
you know, that's that's what I would do. And I would I would when you by the way, when when you guys when you guys get this, when you order this, and you know, you pay the seven dollars shipping and handling, you get the ebook and the audiobook free immediately as well. Immediately. So all that stuff is accessible the second you hit the button. So I you know, I might grab that. Uh, and for you know seven dollars shipping and handling, it's it's a it, you know it, it's a sweet deal. And the other thing is, um, you know, if you already if you already have it, you have the ebook, so you could you could go through it. But I would use those tactics and everything that we talked about that was kind of the outline for today. That's what I would do. Buzzing by. All right, Lori M. Okay, this is great. Lori M. asks, she says, Hello, Andy. Hope you are well. Been very busy following on your advice. Love that. Set up a new LinkedIn. Managed to get first degree connections at the target company. Any suggestions for the next steps? Yes. So, I'm not sure how you got the connection, if you just sent them a connection request and then they just accepted it, or if you had a little primer that said, hey, I'm expanding my network, I'm looking to develop relationships with people like yourself, uh, I'm targeting your company or whatever. If you, uh, if you did that, if you did not do that, then I would do that. Say, hey, thank you for accepting my connection. Uh, I'd like to reach out to you because I'm in the middle of a job search and I, I'm fond of your organization and so on. So that, that'd be one thing. The other thing is I would start looking at in that organization if you can find whoever your boss might be or a potential boss or a senior person in that area. In that area. And I have a couple of sweet cover letters uh, called the boss hunting cover letters. I have one that you can use uh, if you know a position exists. If this is a target company where you do not know if a position exists, I have a letter for that as well. It's free. Uh, the boss hunt. You just go check out um, cover letter templates. You know how to hunt with these boss co cover letters or something. Just type boss hunting on my YouTube channel or my blog, and you will get right to it. And I would use those, and I would start mailing your resume and and using those cover letter tactics for sure i mean that would be kind of the next step in that process for sure without without a doubt lori i hope that helped deborah walls thank you jim schultz phd jim schultz super dude chicago based he talks on health and finances f cubed is his youtube channel He's a, he's a nut in a great way, and I would highly recommend that you guys check him out. Uh, all kinds of fun stuff, especially if you're into health and finances, which we all should be. So, Jim, great to see you, man. You're uh, glad to have you. Another one of my YouTube buddies. All right. Let's see. Oop. I think I saw a question there from Sam. Sorry, I'm... Boop. Oh, man. When my finger slips... Here we go. <laughs> that's not a question. Hang on, that's not a question. All right, but Sam, thank you for that chuckle. Jose, question. Dear Andy, I'm in the process for a regional position. My regional experience is short. How could I sell myself knowing I have the ability and skills to be successful? Jose, phenomenal question. So let's let's bring this one back, folks. And because we all encounter this, right? We, you know, so so Jose's question is, dear Andy, I'm in the process for a regional position, but his regional experience is short. How could he sell himself knowing he has the ability and skills to be successful? So whenever you are interviewing for a position that on the paper appears to be a step up or you know has some responsibilities that you might not have experience with. The best thing that you can do is make sure that when you're in the interview, you are mapping how your experience maps to the capabilities that are required 
to do that job. So in Jose's particular experience, or his particular question that is, um, it seems as though the regional expertise is short, meaning he probably has experience doing something locally. I'm not sure, Jose, what your, what your function is, but let's just say uh, you were a salesperson and you're used to selling in a local city and now you're getting a region that includes a state or multiple states. So the, 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 the scope of the position is expanding or maybe you're a manager and you were managing people in one area, now you're managing people in different states, whatever it might be. The important thing about you know taking a broader scope like that is the capability that you need is good organization, um, you know, good people management or sales management skill, whatever it is, uh, good customer relationship building skills or whatever that is. And then when you look at uh, making it a larger territory, in some cases, that's just making sure that you're you're organized to handle multiple pieces instead of just one. So I would start looking for uh, you know the capabilities that are required for you to expand and then make sure that as you tell your stories or your responses in the job interview, you are highlighting that and you are making it very clear and overt about, well, to go from a local position to a regional position requires this capability. And they're gonna agree because you did your homework, and because I need greater organizational skills to handle a wider range of customer types and so on, or whatever it might be, I've demonstrated that experience by, then show them what you've done, and that and show them the translation. We call that connecting the dots uh, for the employer, but that's what you need to do. So whatever your function is, and whatever additional capabilities are required in that step up, you just need to make sure that your stories are covering that. It's the same thing, uh, and let's take this one step further. For those of you who are applying to jobs that are, so like in Jose's case, he says I, he's got, uh, he's in the process for a regional position, so he's already got the interview. But if you don't have the interview and you need to send your resume and your cover letter and your email intro, you want to make sure that you're highlighting those capabilities and say, you know, we know for a regional position, it requires great organizational skills to do this, blah, 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 where I demonstrated this here or whatever it is, but it's the same tactic that you want to use regardless of where you are in the process. So Jose and everybody else, I hope that helps, and that was a fantastic question. And Lori, you're welcome, and I'm glad you're halfway. Cindy Christopher, how are you? Hi Andy, what is your advice uh, for meet the team chats? Oh, interesting. This is with the team that I would be uh, part in a tech startup. So, uh, Cindy, I'm I, I wondering if you can clarify something for me. Um, because meet the team chats could be, I go in to meet the team and I chat with them. Uh, and I would handle that one way. And if I was chatting on, I'm assuming you don't mean, although I don't know, if it's a small startup, if it's like a chat via video or literally like a chat chat. I, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, but if you could just clarify that and then uh, just drop to the bottom, clarify that. Kara uh, will let me know in Slack that you what what the clarification is and then I'll answer the question uh, just in the next in the next break here. All right, we're at, we're at 1212. I'm gonna take some more questions. We're running a little over today, that's okay. Make sure if you have not grabbed this, get it. At least get the free book. Uh, for seven bucks shipping and handling, I send it anywhere in the world. And you know, you got till tomorrow to pay the ninety-seven bucks for the course. And if you're not sure and you're on the fence, get the program. It's you get a thirty-day money-back guarantee. So if you don't like it, you can always you can always kick it back. But that ninety-seven dollars special only runs through Friday night. And the other thing is, if uh, if you are enjoying this, if you enjoyed the book, if you're enjoying the video, if you're enjoying the live sessions and all that good stuff. Click the thumbs up and share this. We're going to be on for a few more minutes, and um, you know, and I'll, I'll I'll do my best to take as many more questions as I can. All right, Rob Vasquez. Uh, okay, so Rob's got a great question. How do you address having dropped out of college on a resume and on an interview, no plans to return? Okay, so Rob. Uh, your situation is common. We have a lot of people that go to college and don't finish. And 
the first thing is if you have a decent number of college credits, meaning you know you were halfway through, three quarters way through, any of that good stuff, and you dropped out, you could put accumulated X number of credits, and or you know 100 credits or 90 credits or whatever it is, if you wanted, uh, if you wanted to indicate that you could, you don't have to. Uh, you can also put your college and that you studied whatever you studied and you don't put your degree because you didn't earn a degree. Uh, if you're in an interview, you just, you highlight that. Uh, if they ask, just say, no, I, I went to school, but for in whatever reason, I started working and so on. Now, you have to handle it a little bit differently if you're uh, really young and it, you're 22 and you dropped out. Or if you're 42 and you got 20 years of work experience, I would probably play it off and I wouldn't even make a big deal out of it that you got 20 years of work experience. They're gonna be more interested in that. If you are on the younger side and they um, and, and, and you and you were asked about whether you're gonna go back, then I think you need to articulate uh, your viewpoint that uh, I, you know, and what you could say is I'm still considering that it's also going to determine, you know, be determined based on the job I take, whether I can accommodate, you know, the time to carve out of my schedule to to take those classes, uh, whether, you know, an employer might be willing to pay the tuition um, because I because I have to earn. And that's OK to say that's totally OK. That's totally OK. That's how I would handle that in an interview and depending on, on where you are on the spectrum of age, that is. Hope that helped. Look at this one. Sandra Gomez, use your techniques in an interview yesterday, and by the time I walked in my car, I'd received the offer. Have another interview this coming Monday. Sandra, love that. Love that. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. John, great to see you. Chairman, yes, I am. It's great. How do we? Uh, Guru Dell, uh, Guru Dell 12, uh, to get my services or training. Uh, depending on what you want, you can head to the Mile Walk Academy. So it's milewalkacademy.com. And there's free training, paid training. There's online courses. So I basically have three major types of, of training. There's online training. Well, there's, there's, free, there's free low cost books and, and free downloads and all that good stuff. I also have a very modest uh, monthly coaching program that you can get in for $19 a month. And that's a monthly coaching session that we do every four weeks. It's awesome. People in the Mile Walk Academy who are in that, in that uh, membership come. It's like I said, $19 a month. And I cover uh, career topics. So career development and job, seeking, job searching. So last month we covered the first 90 days on the job, but we also covered some job seeking to topics as well. That's a very modest way. It's $19 a month. I also have one-on-one -on -one coaching that's much more expensive, and I also have online training programs that are a blend of video training programs plus the tools and the templates, as well as ongoing coaching uh, with me. So if you check out the Mile Walk Academy, you can look at that, and if you have any questions, uh, Guru, you can email me at support at milewalk.com. And just like, just like Larry, Larry Lee, who was in that email, he did that. He went, he found some training, he took it, he saw um, a sales video on, for my boot camp, and he said, I love it, but I don't have a lot of time. Is there something else? He emailed me, I emailed him back, and that's the email I sent him, and it's great stuff. By the way, I look at all my emails. Uh, I always appreciate your emails. I can't respond to every single person, but if you have questions about the services or you can't find something on the Mile Walk Cat, I always get back to those people. Uh, because we want to make sure you're getting what you need. I can't, uh, you know, I can't answer all 3,000 emails and all the questions I get from everybody about that wanting free coaching advice. Um, so I hope people respect that, um, and I love having you as part of my community. But that's why I show up every week uh, to answer your questions uh, on on Thursdays. So I hope that helps. All right, Hector, great to have you, first timer. And then Jasmine, after the second interview, how are we doing on time? After the second interview, the interviewer says they will get back to me by the following week. I then call HR the next week and was told they have another candidate and they can only get back to me the following week. I then send a message to the interviewer after the first interview and he says I am shortlisted. Well, tomorrow for people in other countries. Wait, hey, oops, sorry. 
I'm not sure. Sorry, Jasmine, I'm trying to find your the rest of your thing. Is the end of the week? Should I call? Okay, wait, let me, let me piece this together. Okay, so Jasmine's asking, after the second interview, the interviewer got back to her and said, he'll get back to you the following week. You got in touch with HR the next week and then was told they have another candidate. They can only get back to me the following week. You sent a message to the interviewer of the first interview and he says you're shortlisted. Tomorrow is the end of the week. Should I call now to the HR or the first interviewer or simply wait? I would wait a few more days and I would just, I would. it's already Thursday uh, and I'm assuming it's Thursday where you are in the Philippines or uh, Malaysia or wherever you are. And, uh, and I would probably wait till early next week and I would check in with the HR people. That's what I would do. Okay, um, and then back to Guru Dell. Uh, for people in other countries, it's the same. So for people in other countries, uh, and just so you you guys know, we uh, in the Mile Walk Academy, there are people from every inhabited continent in the world, and we have all different kinds of of programs and a lot of the concepts, virtually all the concepts that we teach apply regardless of where you live. If you are interested in one-on-one coaching, I do that through Zoom and we have a Zoom session, unless you're in Chicago, the Chicagoland area and we meet face-to-face. But if you're in other countries or other states or cities, we do it through Zoom and it's recorded for you. So everything that we, you and I talk about for you in particular is recorded. And uh, and so that that's a great that's a great program as well. So it's just like this, except you and I can see each other. So I hope that helped. All right. Hey, Rosemary, how are you? Glad you got the book. Leah Kelly, how are you? Leah Kelly, great question. Uh, follow up to Stephanie's question about the gap in employment. I've been raising kids for 13 years. Uh, how do I explain that? And the way that you explain it in the cover letter, the resume, or the interview is that. You've been raising your kids for 13 years. It is so, so common. And all of you stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home dads, I if you go to the Mile Walk blog uh, or andrewlasavita.com, and you type in stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home parent, up will come a booklet that's free for you and how to navigate back to work. So how to go from stay-at-home parent uh, to working professional again or something. I, you know, I had, you know, I had some catchy title. But just type stay-at-home parent and the booklet will come up and it's that thick. It's got all the guidelines in it for you. Tell me I don't love you people. All right, on to the next one. Terry Crichton, great. I'm glad you love the book. Caroline, great to have you from Kenya. You can get the book by clicking the uh, in the description. If you just expand the description of this live stream, in there is a link that will send you to the interview intervention book page. You'll see me talking with the book. I got a blue button down shirt on. I tell you all about it and that you just click it and then you fill in your your first name and your email takes you to a page where you put in your shipping information and you pay your $7. And that's also the spot where you can get the interview intervention course for less than 100 bucks today. All right. Tammy Ann, great to see you. Great to have you in the programs. Love it, love it, love it. Thank And thank you for being such a great supporter. George, new to live. Failing with hiring managers. 25-year guy. Interview well with peers. Cultural fit. But bosses say no. George, definitely, definitely watch Three Keys to Ace Any Job Interview and get the book. Believe me, it, it, will, it, will, it will be eye-opening. All right. Let me see. Chamion Thomas, how do I convey to a future employer that I can transition to an analyst role? With limited analytical experiences, my formal training is in statistics, but I've done more technician type work. Champion, uh, number one, awesome. If you're a statistics person, you have great analytics skills, I would assume. 
So going back to what I was talking about with a few of the others about uh, optimizing and leveraging your capabilities, what are the capabilities? So when I say capabilities, so there's, think in terms of four things. So if, you, if you've not heard me talk about the hiring prophecies, I've done a lot of analysis, predictive analytics, and a whole bunch of stuff about what predicts a good employee. For, and I teach this to companies. There's four things, cultural fit, capabilities, achievement record, and particular skills. So your particular skills are your statistician or your technician or your whatever. But then there are capabilities. Those are the foundational traits that make a good whatever, whatever. So, you know, good, um, uh, let's see, it's an, good analysts have good analytical skills. They have good organizational skills. They have good deduction skills and so forth. Those are the foundational traits that make a good analyst a good analyst. And then the list goes, goes on and on. So what, what you need to do is you need to highlight those, those capabilities, determine what they are. You probably know what they are already. And you need to make sure that in the, your responses to your interview, interview questions or in your cover letter or whatever, that you are feeding that to the employer. So you're connecting the dots of how what you've done translates into good capabilities and traits that, that, that analysts need even though you have limited analyst experience. So, you know, if you're a project manager, for all you project managers out there, or maybe you're a team leader, but you haven't been a project manager yet, but that's the next step in your evolution, well, good team leaders have, you know, good time management skills, good work planning skills, good staff management skills, good customer relationship building skills, you know, all of that good stuff. All of that stuff translates into the next level. So you want to do the same kind of thing for your role or any of you that are stepping up stepping over in careers uh, as well. That's very important. So I hope that helps. All right. Um, oh, hey, mom, how are you? How are you? I will, uh, we all wish my nephew Michael a happy birthday today. All right, let me see. 1225. All right, I'm going to take I'm going to take a couple more here. Patricia, how are you? How can I explain in my cover letter that in spite of my age and experience, I'm applying to a lower level position because I want to work for that company? I love this. So, everybody, this is um this is really Patricia, thank you. This is a fantastic question. So, Patricia asks, "How can I explain in my cover letter that in spite of my age and experience, I'm applying to a lower level position because I want to work for that company?" So, Patricia, what I would do is the first thing that I would do is I would check out my video on how to apply when there's no job opening, even though there's a job opening here, but just it's a video titled "How to Apply for a No Job Opening" or "When There's No Job Opening." in that video i give anybody who watches it who chooses to download it my seven sentence cover letter the seven sentence cover letter is how you target a company when there's no job opening but in your case even though there's a job opening the opener of the cover letter talks about why you want to work for that company so what you can do is don't open up with I'm the reason I'm contacting you is because I want to apply for this lower level position. What you want to do is you want to shuffle or turn over your cover letter and open up with why you want to join that organization, that that's the most important thing. And the reason why you want to join that organization is because of this rationale. Then I also noticed that there was an opportunity open for whatever. While I notice my credentials might exceed the responsibilities, I still would like to apply because it's important for me to get in the company. Just just something like that and you know be you, but but if you start with that template, it you will be able to fill that right in and you just want to highlight that it's it's more important that you join that company. And let's be honest folks, and I always say this, I say, I, I think I say this every week. You join a company, you don't join a job. And if you join the right company, you don't have the job you joined for for very long. And I mean that in a good way because good companies know how to elevate their people. So that's what I would do, Patricia. And I hope, and I hope that helps. All right. Let's see. Let me see if I can grab one more. Folks, if you're liking this, hit the thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed so that every time I put out a video, which is every Tuesday, you get a recorded video every Thursday. 
Uh, you also get a recorded video and we do a live show. Uh, so we got new videos every week. We got live shows every week. I'm back next Thursday. I don't know what the topic is. We'll take a look at the chat. We'll see what's on everybody's mind. Um, but let's, uh, Sam, great, back to you. Hey, Dave Wired, boom. Hey, Dave Wired, this is awesome. Dave Wired is a boot camper, just got a job offer and accepted, and his background check went through, and he's a system engineer starting Monday. Love it. Buddy, I got your email. I will respond to you over the weekend. Uh, that is awesome, awesome news. Boot camper, I love it. All right, folks, 1230, an hour and a half today. I love it. Make sure to grab the book. It's free, $7 shipping and handling anywhere, even to Perth, Australia, which is the farthest point on the planet from me. And you get the ebook, the audio book. Uh, you also get an ebook titled How to Interview the Employer, 75 Great Questions to Ask Before You Take Any Job. And you can get the interview intervention course, which is normally $297 for $97 through tomorrow. So love you all. I will see you. Have a great week and we'll catch up. You'll see me live next Thursday. Take care.